Shalom. Welcome to Prophecy Ministries Sunday evening service. Let's dive right into it. So I know a lot of y'all sleepy. I, I see you. You sleepy. Quit playing games. All right. Yeah, scriptures will wake you up in a minute. Revelation. We are in the book of Revelation. We're almost finished with it. We're in chapter 19. And we are at verse 8. Now, because remember last week we found out that the, the bride has made herself ready for the marriage with the Lamb, right? Okay, watch this. Let's start Revelation chapter 19 and let's get into verse 8. The scripture says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Okay, so the her is the woman. She used to be the harlot. She is now the bride of Christ. She's the lamb's wife. And what it was, it was granted to her that she should be clothed in what? Watch this. Why is she wearing fine linen? Who, 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 who else wears linen? Christ wears linen. He's the man clothed in linen throughout all the book of Daniel, right? So now we find out, okay, well, she needs to be dressed. She needs to match him. But the linen represents the righteousness of saints. Give me Isaiah 61. Let's take a look at verse 10. See, because he's got to get himself all ready, and we have to get ourselves all ready. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. The scripture says, I will greatly rejoice in Yahweh. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom, that's Christ, decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride, that's us, adorneth herself with her jewels. So this this wedding is a big deal. Like you don't go to a wedding and you're like, yeah, I'm just going to go like this. Because <laughs> you guys remember, we covered a story last week about some people that got invited to the wedding. And when the king came in, he saw the guy wearing a garment and his garment wasn't ready for the wedding. He was not clothed with righteousness and he got thrown out of the wedding. Right. So this is the time period when we should be getting ourselves decked and ready for the return of the Lord. Give me Psalms 132 verse 9. Psalms 132 verse 9. I'm going to find out a little bit more about this linen that we need to be putting on. The scripture says, let thy priests be clothed with righteousness and let thy saints shout for joy. So we have been told all the way back in the book of Psalms that there's a certain garment that we need to be wearing at all times. We don't know exactly when the Lord is coming back. It would be terrible for him to come back and you're like, wait, wait, I'm not ready. I got to go see if I can find my garment of righteousness. You need to know exactly where it is. You need to be wearing it every day. This is what's interesting about the garment of righteousness. You guys ever heard of the full armor of God? There's no difference between those two things. One transforms into the other. Your, your whole armor of God, the seven pieces of it, at the appearing of Christ is going to transform. You've been wearing that, putting it on every day, and at the appearing of Christ, it transforms into this robe of righteousness that he expects us to be wearing. Back to Revelation chapter 19. Let's look at verse 8 one more time. It says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed, that means clothed, in fine linen, white and um, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Give me verse 9. It says, And he saith unto me, Who's the me? Who's the he? The angel not Christ, 
there's an angel that's speaking all of these things to him. But that angel we found out a few chapters ago is actually a man. What's that man's name? Was it Jeremiah? He's seeing Jeremiah, right? Watch. We're going to come because we that was an amazing revelation that Jeremiah was transported in the spirit. We're going to find out in just about one more verse that even though to us it is an angel, he says that he is the man. Watch this. And he, the man or the angel, saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Now, we covered the wedding parable last week, right? You guys remember it? You guys remember the wedding parable? Um, I think we were in Sabbath Bible study and we covered the virgins, right? The five were wise, five were foolish. They didn't have no oil in their lamps. At midnight, the Lord came back and they were not ready to go. Okay, we covered all of that. Watch this. Give me verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. Now the angel that John the Revelator sees in his vision, he fell down at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, the angel here clearly tells him, I'm a man just like you. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Because now we know who that man is that was there. Now watch this. John does it more than once. He, he's so amazed at all the things that are being shown to him that he falls down to worship the angel or the man. You guys know angel simply means messenger. Malak in Hebrew. Malak. This could be a man, or it could be an angel. He falls down at his feet to worship him, and he lifts him up. He's like, no, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant just like you. I'm of your brethren. Now watch this. He says, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, this same thing happens later, because John is hard-headed. Give me Revelation chapter 22, which is the very last chapter of Revelation. Revelation chapter 22, verse 8. In Revelation 22, verse 8, John is so amazed, he gets ready to do it again. It says, and I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which shewed me these things. Do we worship angels? No, we're not supposed to worship angels. Give me verse 9. Watch what the angel says. Then he saith unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets. He clearly just told him who he is. It's me. It's me. Look, he says, And of them which keep the sayings of this book. But he didn't tell him to worship. Worship God. We've been talking about that lately, right? We talked about that last Friday. We talked about this morning. Worshiping God is what you were created to do. What does it mean to worship? It means to love more than you love anything else, right? Give me Acts chapter 3, verse 22. I want to talk about the thing that he said, where he said, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of of prophecy because we know that spirit is words so the the testimony of jesus is the words that prophecies are made of is what he's saying now watch this acts chapter 3 verse 22 you're about to hear the testimony of jesus for moses truly said unto the fathers a prophet shall the lord your god raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Moses said, you guys remember, Moses is the lawgiver, right? Moses prophesied all the way back in, I believe it was Deuteronomy. He prophesied that the Lord was going to raise up 
another prophet similar to Moses and that we would hear him and listen to him. Who is that prophet? That prophet is Christ. Now, you know who people thought it was before Christ came? They thought it was John the Baptist. And they, they grabbed John the Baptist and they said, are you Elijah? And he's like, no, nah, I'm not Elijah. My name is John. John the Baptist. How you doing? Last name Baptist. Middle name the. And they said, well, are you that prophet? And he said, no, I'm not that prophet. Because that prophet is a specific person that we knew was going to be similar to Moses. What does that mean? It don't mean he's going to do away with the law. That means he's going to be preaching the law. But we would listen to him. Watch this. Give me the next verse. This is the testimony of Jesus coming out of the mouth of Moses. It says, and it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Next verse. Yeah. And all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Now we see how the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy because Samuel was the first prophet in the Bible, right? And he said every prophet after him all the way up to this time, every single one of them were talking about this man. Give me the next verse. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. One more verse. Verse 26, he says, Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. What did, what did Jesus come to do? To turn us away from our iniquities. Every word that every prophet ever spoke was in relation to the coming of the final prophet, the Christ, and he would turn us away from our sins. That's the testimony of Jesus. Okay, now watch this. Give me 1 John chapter 5, verse 10. 1 John chapter 5, verse 10. This is also the testimony of Jesus. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Where's the witness at? The witness is in you if you believe on the Son of God. It says, he that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. That word record, when you hold your finger down on it, it tells you that it's testimony. You didn't believe the testimony. You condemned already if you don't believe in the testimony. Think about how serious that is. There's a lot of people who don't believe the testimony. They don't believe the record. The what? The record. Record. That sounds familiar. Record. Yeah. Huh. Give me another verse. Verse 11. And this is the record. This is the testimony that God hath given to us eternal life and this life where is it located at okay now this part is very important this is the testimony when we're like yo we believe in the law and the testimony this is the testimony the testimony is the record that's what a testimony is are you willing to go on record and say that that thing actually happened that's what they say to you when you're in court and you're like yeah I'm here to testify okay this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. What did he give to us? Eternal life. And this life is in his son. Okay, so if the life is in his son, I have to have the son in me to have eternal life in me. You guys see how that works, right? Give me verse 12. He that hath the son hath life. That makes sense because Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, so if you have the Son, then you have life. It says, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That is the testimony of Jesus. These are the two things that are necessary. You absolutely must believe that Jesus came and died for your sins, not only for the sins of Israel, but for the sins of the whole world. That whosoever believeth in him, you guys familiar with that? Whosoever 
I know some people who think whosoever is a very limited group of people. Whosoever in the Bible that I read from means anybody and everybody. Whosoever. Give me Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Now, this thing that I'm talking to you about, that we call the testimony, is the gospel. This is the reason why the scripture says, repent and believe the gospel. You have to obey the gospel. The gospel is the testimony of Jesus. The scripture says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart, what do I have to believe? That God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What does it mean to be saved? It means for you to be raised from the dead. That's all it means. Because what? If you don't get raised from the dead, are you saved? <laughs> nope. Death won. Right? Okay, but if you're saved, that means you endured all the way to the end. And death was defeated because it couldn't hold you down the same way it couldn't hold him down. This is the gospel. This is the core of what we must believe. Now, I know we believe in the law. But you have to understand this concept that if he rose from the grave, I plan to rise from the grave too. That's the testimony of Jesus. Okay, take me back to Revelation chapter 19. That's the scripture that our church, you guys can probably see it down there, is founded on. That's the reason why we're called prophecy. Because we are the prophecy. We believe that he rose from the grave. We also believe that we will rise from the grave. Okay, where Revelation, give me verse 11. Now watch what happens. It says, and I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. You guys remember the chiasm, right? So we're on the opposite side of the chiasm. Because I remember somebody coming on a white horse uh, a while ago. Who was that? The Antichrist came on a white horse. You know, people who are not studied in the scriptures, they think that Jesus came on that white horse. No, Jesus didn't come on that white horse. He came on this one. And I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse. Okay, there's a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. That is Jesus. And in righteousness, that means according to the law, he doth judge. What is he judging according to? The law. Righteousness. His righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. And thy law is the truth. So he's going to judge and he's going to make war. All right. Watch this. Give me Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. If you're reading Revelation chapter 6, and you read verse 1 and you think that Jesus came back in Revelation chapter 6. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. I want to say it. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. No, I'm not going to say it. No, I'm going to say it like this. You need to pray. <laughs> if you think that Jesus came back in Revelation chapter 6 verse 1, you need to be here on the Sabbath. Right? Because watch this. The Bible says, and I saw... When the lamb opened one of the seals, who's the lamb? That's Christ. Okay, he opened the seal and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts sang, come and see. Give me verse two. Okay, he's the lamb. He just opened the seal. And I saw and behold, a white horse. <laughs> and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer that's not jesus this dude he's suspect he got a bow and ain't got no arrows he's real threatening until you be like well do something and he's like pew, pew. He, he he appears to be very frightening so we're not supposed to be afraid of him we're supposed to recognize it other people in the world they they got to be afraid the antichrist is the first one to come soon as the first seal is open that's when you know, boom, it's really going down now because the fake Christ, the false Christ has come and he came on a white horse pretending to be Jesus, but he had a bow and didn't have no arrows. And what does it say? A crown was given unto him. Who gave him that crown? Let's talk about that. 
Who gave him that crown? There's a whole group of people that are still waiting for the first coming of their Messiah. They're going to crown him. We, we not going to crown him. We know who he is. See, it's easy for them to be deceived. See, the Christ already came. We're waiting for the second coming. But there's a whole group of people, a whole so-called religion, running around with our names, <laughs> living in the land that's supposedly our land. It's not really the land. And they're waiting for the first coming of the Christ. And when the Antichrist comes looking like the Christ on his white horse, they're going to crown him the king of the Jews. Now, man, he he looks like Jesus. Sounds like he's not Jesus. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. What is he going to use when he conquers? You guys remember? Peace. He's going he's going to conquer using peace. What did Jesus say? You think that I came to send peace? I tell ye nay, but rather a sword. So Jesus, when he comes back, he's not coming for peace. Everybody knows that, right? But when the Antichrist comes, he's coming, and he's screaming peace. If you don't know these scriptures, you're going to have the whole thing twisted up, right? Watch this. Give me Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4. Because Christ is the righteous judge. It says, in righteousness doth he judge and make war. Isaiah 11, verse 4. It says, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with what? With the rod of his mouth. We're going to be hearing more about the rod of his mouth. That is a very important thing in the scriptures. If anybody comes on a white horse and they're not able to smite the earth with the rod of their mouth, then it's not Jesus. Because that's part of the prophecy. That's part of the testimony all the way back in Psalms. You can go back to Deuteronomy. You're going to find the fact that he's going to rule with a rod of iron. Now it says here, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Last week, was it Friday? We was learning some Hebrew. Remember that? Remember, we was, what's that word? It says, and with the breath of his lips, with the ruach. What is that? Spirit. It's breath. It's spirit. What, what is he going to use? He's just going to use the spirit. The spirit comes out when he speaks the word. Watch this. Give me Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. How many crowns does the Antichrist have? Just one, because there's only one nation of people on the whole earth that are waiting for the first coming of the Christ. They are going to give him their crown. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. I want you to see now when Christ comes, he got a gang of crowns because <laughs> he's king over the whole earth. It says, and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. If all the kingdoms in the whole world became the kingdoms of Yahweh Shai, he would have a gang of crowns. Isn't that right? He wouldn't be coming back with one little puny crown. You got one crown? I don't, I'm, I don't believe in you. Give me Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Let's get into this. Because remember, in Revelation it said, he comes on a white horse. And he was called. Who remembers what he was called? Does it say that his name is faithful and true? It just says he's called faithful and true. Now you got to pay attention to the name versus what the name is called. Okay, watch this. The Bible says, for unto us a child is born. That child is the Christ. Unto us a son is given. That son is the son of the most high God and the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called wonderful. Is his name wonderful? Nope. His name is called wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Are any of those things his name? Nope. That's what his name is called. We already know what his name is. But his name is called 
those things. Now, let me show you how that works because sometimes that's hard to grasp. <clears throat> if you didn't tell the truth all the time, I could say that your name, your name, whatever your name is, I'm calling you a liar. Is liar your name? Nope. But when people talk about you, they mention your name and then they say, a person's a liar. Don't kick it with them. If you were a thief or you were some other thing, you became known for that thing. Does that make sense? What you become known for is the definition, Bahashem, in the name, right? Remember, Yahweh was saying, by my name, Yahweh, I was not known unto Abraham and Isaac, right? I was known by the name El Shaddai, God Almighty. But to you, to all of us, his name is Yahweh. We know him for that reputation. He's a deliverer. Now watch this. And his name shall be called and his reputation shall be wonderful. When you mention the name of Jesus, Yahweh Shai, the Christ, we be like, man, that's wonderful. What a wonderful name it is. His name is called wonderful. His name is not wonderful. You see how that works? Counselor, he's my counselor. The mighty God. Now watch this. Take me back. Revelation chapter 19. Take a look at verse 11 again. Got to pay attention to the name being called because we're going to find out that he has a name, another name when he comes back. This is not something that his name is called. You find his name is called many things, but he's coming back with a name. Okay. It says, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. We covered that. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. Give me verse 12. Let's get a description of this guy that's coming back. It says, his eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Okay. He don't have a title written. He's got an actual name. Let's talk about this for a second. When he comes back, his name will not be Jesus. Why? He told us, I will not meet thee as a man. I'm not coming back as a man. He came the first time as a man. His name, Yahweh Shai, means he who saves. He's not coming back for that. <laughs> He's coming back with a different purpose. Most people don't know the purpose of the second coming of Christ. Anybody in here know what it is? What is the reason? I know we think it's all about us. Well, he's coming back to get me. That's not what he's coming back for. He's coming back to establish his, his authority. What did you say? Pay back our enemies. He's coming back to establish that payback. What did he say? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. What is he coming back for? To repay. That's what he's coming back for. Us receiving salvation is a byproduct of him getting payback for everything that was done. Okay, so when he comes back, we will not say, hey, it's Jesus. <laughs> he won't be going by that name. What does the scripture say? He has a name written that no man knew but he himself. Now watch, you got to follow this part. It's very tricky. Give me verse 13. And he was clothed with the vesture, that's a vest, dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Is that his name? Is that his name? Look at it carefully. His name is called the Word of God. Is that his name? Hmm. We were studying this before, and this occurred to me today. His name is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the word. Okay. His name is called the word of God. The word actually is his name, but that's not in Hebrew. That's not what his name is in Hebrew. When it's saying that he has a name written, did you ever stop to think, where's that name written at? You see that in verse 12? It says he has a name written. The Bible tells you where the name is written. We're going to get to it in just a second. I want to cover a couple things in here. He was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood. Why would the Lord be coming back on a white horse wearing white linen 
It's clean and it's white when he comes, but as soon as he touches down, it's red. Why is it red all of a sudden? What has he been doing? Why did his clothing change colors? What did you, what did you say? In the wine press, what did you say? Smashing the grapes in the wine press. That's very good. Let's take a look because Isaiah saw this and he couldn't understand. Wait a minute. You're supposed to be coming back in clean linen, white, fresh. Nothing's whiter than it. How come you're all bloody? <laughs> give me Isaiah. Give me Isaiah chapter 63, verse one. Now, I've shown you guys this before, but we need to see it again. It's always mind blowing. There's a conversation here written in Isaiah and it's written between Isaiah and Yahweh Shai. But it's written at the time when he comes back. So Isaiah is in a trance and he's seeing the return of the Christ and he's confused about what he sees because he knows he's supposed to be wearing white, but he sees him wearing red. Okay, here we go. Who is this that cometh from Edom? Where's he coming from? From Edom with dyed garments from Basra. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. That's the question that Isaiah asks. This is the answer that the Lord gives. He says, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. If you don't know how to rightly divide the word, you don't know that the question and the answer are both contained in one verse. Isaiah sounds schizophrenic right there. You don't understand that there's a question being asked and then it's being answered. Okay, let's see more of the conversation. Give me verse two. It says, this is Isaiah speaking. He says, wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? Isaiah said, wait a minute, something's wrong though. Because you're wearing red. How come your clothing is red if the prophecy says that it's supposed to be white? Isaiah, he's specific on them details, right? The Most High is very specific on them details too. He's like, wait a minute, I don't quite understand. I see you and you look glorious. Man, you traveling in the greatness of your strength, but there's a problem with the scriptures. <laughs> what you're wearing doesn't match up with what you're supposed to be wearing. How come your clothing is red instead of white? You look like you've been stepping on grapes. Give me the next verse. Let's see the answer. Now, this is Jehovah Shai responding. He says, I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people, there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment. Give me verse four. He continues speaking and it says, for the day of vengeance is in mine heart and the year of my redeemed is come. What day? What day? <laughs> the day of vengeance. What's he coming back for? You thought it was you. No, that's very prideful to think that he's coming back for you. Yeah, he's coming back for his namesake. They have blasphemed his name. The whole world doesn't believe that he is who he says he is. He's coming back to prove that he is who he says he is and to pay back all of our enemies. That's the day of vengeance. And in addition to that, as a byproduct, we are his redeemed. We will be redeemed when he comes. Does that make sense so far? All right, take me back to Revelation. Now we understand Revelation chapter 19. We were at verse 13. <laughs> and he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood. We covered that part. Now we know why he's dipped in blood. Let's talk about his name. And his name is called the word of God. Now, take a look at verse 12 again. It says, his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself okay we're starting to piece this thing together and we're realizing that he is the word his name is called the word no man knows the word but him but that's not the name that's written watch this go to verse four wait i got one more let me see give me john give me first john no give me St. John chapter 1 verse 1. John chapter 1 verse 1.
The scripture says, in the beginning, is there anything before the beginning? In the beginning was what? The Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Give me the next verse. You guys got this part memorized, don't you? Everybody got this part. The same was in the beginning with God. What was in the beginning? The Word. Okay? Who's the Word? Jesus is the Word. Okay? Is that his name? No, that's what he is. So now we're finding out that there's a who and there's a what. Hey, give me one more. Give me verse three. All things were made by him. Who? The word. That's what it said in the previous verses. Now, we know that's Jesus. That's the Christ. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. One more verse. Verse four. In him. See what it says? was life <laughs> wait a minute what what is it life for everybody it's opportunity for everybody it's not life for everybody it's life for me though we read them scriptures earlier if you receive the testimony you receive life if you receive his word you receive life if you have his word in you then you have life god gave us eternal life and it scripture clearly says and it was in him in him was life, and the life was the what? The light of man. It's the law that man should live by. See how that works? Because we know that the law is light. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there ain't no light in them. Okay? Now give me 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. It's going to say the same thing. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. What do, what do you hear? You hear words, right? Okay, so you hear words. That which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. So Christ is the word of life. We seen it, we heard it, we looked upon it, our hands have handled it. When I say our hands have handled it, it looks something like this. Because what am I doing? Flipping through the word. My hands are handling the word right here. Okay, watch. Give me the next verse. For the life. Isn't that crazy? Where's the life at? It's in him. For the life was manifested. And we have seen it and bear witness. What do we bear? We bear witness. Watch how these words are going to work. They're going to snap together. We bear witness and shew unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Give me verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. What am I declaring to you when I tell you what I've seen and what I've heard? That's the testimony. That's the gospel. I'm sharing with you the gospel, the testimony of Jesus. Now watch, it tells you why I'm telling you the testimony. It says that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Man, that testimony is powerful, right? One more, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. This scripture is removed from other versions of other, other books that claim to be Bibles. They don't have this scripture in it. Watch, it says, for there are three that bear record. That word, if you hold it down, is going to tell you his testimony. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word. Before he was the Son, he was the Word. How do we know that? The scripture said, in the beginning was the word so he's always been the word he has not always been the son there are three that bear record in heaven the father the word and the holy ghost and these three are one man you need to have that one inside of you now back to revelation chapter 19 so his name watch look at verse 13 again i want you guys to see this this last, this, this stood out to me so much. It says, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. You could explain that to somebody now. And his name is called the word of God, but that's not his name. He has a name and we're going to find it in just a few minutes. Let's keep going. Verse 14. 
And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. What do they look like? They look like righteousness. They look just like him. If he's coming on a white horse, they're coming on a white horse. If he's got white linen, they're coming in white linen. You mean there's armies in heaven? All right, watch this. Give me Jude. Hmm. Hopefully you can find that. I think it's J-U-D. Jude, it only has one chapter. Give me verse 14. Sometimes when people are trying to find Jude, they go to Judges. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see what she can do. She, she's struggling. There's only one verse. So all you got to do is go to, there's only one chapter. All you got to do is go to verse 14. Who thinks she can do it? Annie up. Annie up. I think she can do it. Jude, it's taking her a little time now. There's only three. You can only put in three. And J-U-D is also for judges. What you got? Jude only has one chapter. Okay, click that and give me verse 14. I think she could do it. She needs she needs some encouragement. I knew this one was going to be hard. See, most people, they don't know who Jude is. They don't know where Jude is. Oh, look, she found it. Good job. <laughs> you know she could do it. Jude, only one chapter, verse 14. And Enoch, who's Enoch? The scripture says the seventh from Adam. Why does it tell you that it's the seventh from Adam? Okay, Adam gave birth to so-and-so, gave birth to so-and-so, you know, whatever. The seventh one, his name was Enoch. But Cain, Cain also gave birth to an Enoch. We're not talking about the one that came from Cain. That's a cursed bloodline. We're talking about Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, of these what? Of these armies that are in heaven that's what we're talking about saying behold the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints ten thousands of his saints well, why is it coming back with so many not ten thousand I don't want you to think that I want you to look at ten thousand and then just keep adding zeros on it infinitely because there is an innumerable amount of angels he's bringing this war don't nobody want to be in this war I don't know why he's bringing, he don't even need all them. He just try. you know, like when you're, when you're, um, bullying, <laughs> right? He's just bullying them. He's like, I could handle this all by myself, but boom, look at my team. And he's coming back with his team, right? Let's find out what they're going to do. Give me verse 15. It says to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly, among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him why is he coming back he's coming back to punish those who blasphemed his name and a byproduct of that is you getting saved <laughs> ah, that's amazing okay now watch this ten thousands okay so that's enoch when you open the book of enoch that's in the book of enoch he is quoting from the book of Enoch. But give me Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2. He don't really have to quote from Enoch because it's written all throughout the scriptures that he's coming back with tens of thousands of saints in his army. The scripture says, And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir. Wait a minute. What, where's Seir at? Seir is a mountain. It's called Mount Seir. You know where it's located at? No, not that one. That's the wilderness. That's good thinking. Mount Seir is the mountain of Esau. We were reading earlier in Isaiah, and he said, Who is this that cometh from Edom? Esau's name was changed to Edom. He was specifically coming from the land of Edom when he was red in his apparel. Mount Seir is located in the land of Edom. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran and he came with 10,000s of saints from his right hand went forth a fiery law for them. What's he coming back to do? You, you bringing a law with you? You bringing that pure, raw, unadulterated, uncut word? Yeah, that's a fiery law. That's what he's bringing because that's what he's going to use to judge.
All right, take me back to Revelation chapter 19. That's the armies that are in heaven. They look just like him. Watch this. Give me verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with what? With the rod of iron. See, that first dude on his white horse, he ain't got no rod of iron. He got a bow and no arrows. The Lord is coming back with the sword in his mouth and a rod of iron. And what does he do? And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of El Shaddai. That's Almighty God. From the time that God introduced himself as El Shaddai, the Almighty God, from that time to the time that Christ comes back, he's paying back the vengeance for everything that happened. That's the reason why it says he treads the winepress in the wrath of Almighty God. Every single thing. Like, he don't forget. You guys know that. He don't forget stuff. He's like, write that down. I got to pay that back. Write, write that down. I'm going to get that. And he's going to come back and handle all of that stuff. Wow. Okay, watch this. Give me Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. You guys hanging with me? We only got a couple more verses literally one more verse in revelation it says for the word of god is quick what does that mean it's, it's fast it don't mean fast do it it's alive the word of god is alive I, I know it's alive sometimes i'll be dealing with something and i'll i'll take the book you, it don't work so much with your device because the device is dead the word coming out of the device is alive, but this book itself is alive. You can talk to this book and get answers out of it. See, it's the only book in the whole world where the author is still alive and the book itself is alive. You can talk to the book and talk to the author and then flip some pages and pray about it. And he'll be like, that's crazy that I just happened to flip right to that page and it answered the question because the book is alive. Not for everybody, though. Some people, it's a dead book. A bunch of dead words. It's sealed. They can't, they can't get it open. They can't get no wisdom out of it. Right? For the word of God is quick. That means alive. And powerful. That means full of power. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And of the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now watch this. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Lord knows the heart. And if you study his word, you will be able to discern the thoughts and intentions of people's hearts. So it's almost like you have this special ability. You got, man, you can look at people and be like, huh? Okay. The scripture says a man shall be known by his countenance. <laughs> He's bluffing. I know he's bluffing. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Give me Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. Let's see this sword. This sword is sharper than any two-edged sword. Now watch this. I don't have a sword here. I usually have I usually keep a sword in the church just in case, you know, some people try to run up in here. I got a gang of swords at home. A sword is a great weapon. You know who it's most dangerous to? The user especially when it's double-edged because there's a blade on this side and there's a blade on that side also so as you go to slice somebody else when you pull it back there's a possibility you're gonna slice yourself a double-edged sword is no joke it's very dangerous to the user you got to know how to use it what good is a weapon that you don't know how to use watch this and he had in his right hand seven stars what are those seven stars those are seven angels. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. What is that? Glorious. It's hard to even look at him. Because there's so much light coming off of him. Give me Psalms chapter 2 verse 9. Let's talk about this rod. He smites the nations with the rod. The rod is the rod of correction. We have to all pass under this rod in order to enter into the new covenant. You can't be in the new covenant <laughs> until he comes with the rod. 
Mm. Bible says, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Who's he dashing in pieces? Where did he just come from? He came from Mount Seir. Okay, watch this. Give me Revelation chapter 2, verse 27. Write down these precepts if you collect them. I know some of you guys are collectors. I collect precepts like Pokemon cards. We come on Sabbath and we just trade precepts. Here we go. Watch this. He that hath an ear. Give me verse 27. Revelation chapter 2 verse 27. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father. That's, that's what he's going to do. He's going to break the other nations. His wrath and punishment. Watch this. Let's talk a little bit more about the wine press. <clears throat> Give me Revelation chapter 14. You guys remember how 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 high is the blood after he's doing it? How high? Horse's neck or to the horse's bridle. The, it's a river of blood. How long does it run? Who remembers? No, no, that's a good guess, though. 200 miles of blood. 200 miles? That's like halfway to California. And it's like seven feet high for 200 miles. Watch the scripture. Revelation 14, verse 19. That's a good memory. You remember that stuff. Revelation 14, verse 19. scripture says and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth now watch he thrusts in his sickle and he grabs the people like a cluster of grapes it says and and gather the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of god so he grabbed them people and he he set them down in the wine press give me verse 20 and the wine press was trodden without the city and blood came out of the wine press, even unto the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. That's where you got the thousand from. One thousand six hundred furlongs is equivalent to two hundred modern-day miles. That's how long the blood is. Now it makes sense why Isaiah was tripping. He's like, "Wait, you you red? You're not supposed to be red. You're supposed to be white, and it's glorious, and you look like him." But I gotta check you. All right, watch this. <clears throat> we got one last verse. Excellent time. Watch this. Back to Revelation chapter 19. Let's review that verse 15 real quick. Sometimes we have to see why do we go to those precepts? I got lost. And out of his mouth goeth what? A sharp sword. How sharp is it? Sharper than any two edged sword, right? It can divide the soul from the spirit okay now watch this that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with what a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of el shaddai almighty god okay verse 16 and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh what a name written see when we found out earlier that he had a name written, we didn't think, well, where's it written at? Is it written in the scriptures? Where's it written at? The scripture tells you now where that name is written. He has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. What's the name? King of kings and Lord of lords. What's his name? When he comes back, He's got a whole different name. He's got a whole different purpose. Remember, your name is your purpose. Your name is also your characteristic and your reputation. When he comes back, he has a whole different reputation. His reputation is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Give me 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 14. First Timothy chapter six, verse 14. <clears throat> the Bible proves it. The Bible has multiple witnesses for every verse. The scripture says, mm, which in his times 
he shall shew who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now the Lord is going to show us when Jesus comes back, who is the King of Kings. A potentate is a divine ruler. There's, that's it. That's what potentate means. He's a potentate. He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Give me verse 15 in that same one. Now, let me see 14 real quick. I want to go 14 into 15 so that it'll make more sense. But it just says that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 15, you keep them commandments to the end, which in his times he shall shew, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Does that make sense now? All right. Let me tell you how to say it. Malak, that means king. Ma it's, it's literally spelled exactly how it sounds. Malak. There's only A's and an I, so I don't have to spell this stuff for you. Malak, Hamalakim. Hamalakim, Ha means the, right? Malak, Hamalakim, Adawan, Ha Adawanyam. That is his name when he comes back. King of kings, Lord of lords. Does that make sense? This is the message that I have for you tonight.